Welcome to you all to Comcall's annual 2020 conference for the first time online. So welcome to you all uh, joining us today. Also a special welcome to Galina Alekseva, board member of ICOM Russia, who's joining me in this first uh, short kickoff. Before I go into the topic of our program that we created for you, I would like to thank a couple of people. First, a big thank you to ICOM Russia, uh, and especially to Afanasi Knudovsky and Dinara Kalikovi. Um, we were supposed to have the conference jointly in Kazan this year, but due to the current situation worldwide with COVID, we were unfortunately uh, forced to decide otherwise and go online. Furthermore, I would like to, um, to thank my fellow board members and the amazing support of the young board members group who worked hard in putting together this program that we offer you in the next four days. A special thank you to Antonio Rodriguez, chair of ICOM ICEE, for sharing his knowledge and his experience with doing online things and for uh, giving us um, technical support in these days. Lastly, I want to thank um, today our keynote speakers, Julia Copina and Armando Perla for being here. And we are very much looking forward to their big kickoff of our sessions here. So briefly about the theme, connecting to this year's International Museum Day 2020 focuses on um, museums for equality, diversity and inclusion. So Conkle decided to choose for collecting diversity divergence as dialogue. I'm sure we all, um, we have all been in recent year um, part of many discussions about and have been reading up on articles and publications tackling matters of revisiting museum, rethinking representation within a cultural setting, the singularity of voices and views challenged by ideas of relevance and inclusion. Concepts like participation, decolonization, queering, all have become somewhat commonplace, but have not lost their urgency, proven the most recent events with regards to, for example, the tearing down of the statues that we all have been witnessing in the news. We are still learning so, also that questions of diversity and inclusion are relevant for all parts of our heritage work, whether it's exhibition making, educa education, staffing, research or collecting. It's not something that should be thought of or worked on from just one department, one single dedicated person in the organization, but should be seen as a task for us organizations as a whole, from the floor to the board of directors and back. But letting go of what we know and how we do things is not easy and sometimes even uncomfortable. So at Concord, we reflect on the practice of collecting what has been collected, how it was collected, and why we collect are important questions that should guide us in our work and keep us critical. Here we hope by meeting and sharing to foster new ideas, methodologies, and better understanding of our practices in relation to the society we are part of. By revisiting historical narratives and collections, but also by means of contemporary collecting or documenting the present, we could seek for new meanings demystify or legitimize uh, social memories and try to present different, more complete, so you will, to write in what has been left out, not to replace, but to add, to show the complexity as what lies behind us, the now and our future that should not be reduced and simplified. The coming days, we will focus in different sessions on the contemporary challenges in and perspectives on collecting and collections. How do these matters translate to our daily practices? What insights are there to share and what challenges do we face? Our program is built around topical sessions to be inspired and challenged, mingling, mom uh, mingling moments to get connected with other participants and workshops to go and get to work. We hope you will join us these four days and we hope you enjoy it. Now I would like to give the floor to Galina Alekseva, board member of ICOM Russia and head of the academic research department of the State Memorial and Natural Preserve Yasnaya Polyana, the museum estate of Leo Tolstoy. Galina, Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's 
privilege and uh, and a great uh, pleasure to participate in this uh, com call conference. And on behalf of ICOM Russia, I would like to express our profound satisfaction and happiness that the efforts of ICOM Russia to have this annual com call conference in Russia in Kazan have ended successfully and the annual com call conference though in a different format is taking place. ICOM Russia applied for having this uh, conference in Kazan, the capital of Tatarstan, in 2018. Their preparations took place for about two years and through all the turbulences and lockdowns of this year we are welcoming all the participants from various countries and numerous museums. The conference programs, program looks splendid. I reckon this conference will be a big success. The theme of collecting in the broadest sense is one of the most significant issues we discuss at our annual ICOM conferen conferences, including uh, the international committee I belong to, International Committee for Literary Museums and Composers. Uh, I'm sure that the theme of collecting unites all the museum professionals over the world. That is the theme of collecting unites uh, yeah, and represent one of the main functions of the museum, of any museum. Uh, that is exactly what the museum uh, begins. The subject of this year conference, Collecting Diversity, uh, Diversion as Dialogue, is immensely important. I'm sure that divergence helps to create the dialogue and dialogue creates professional connections and collaboration. That is exactly what we need now, what we always need. Regarding the museum I represent, the Leo Tolstoy Museum Estate at Chiasnaya Palana, I must say that the museum with its synergetic approach to its function and role presents a unique phenomenon as an interdisciplinary, multifunctional institution. The roots of all, of all this originate from the Renaissance style personality of Leo Tolstoy as an artist, philosopher, religious prophet, teacher, soldier, social worker, and reformer, landowner, and farmer. So literature and philosophy, art, religion and history, cultural and social studies, folk art, education, agriculture, forestry. This interdisciplinary and multifunctional approach gives a broad spectrum for the museum collecting, collecting work and for our professional collaboration and various professional museum connections. I wish the best for our conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alina. Um, I would now like to give the word to Alexandra uh, Bonilla, um, fellow board member of ACOMPO, and she will be the moderator of the next session. Good. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, it's been great uh, being here. Uh, I wish we were able to be in Kazan, but uh, well, even here, I'm very pleased to meet everybody and to see everybody here. Um, before I, I pass on um, uh, the, the floor um, to our uh, distinguished speakers today, I would like to uh, just say a few words regarding the practicalities, uh, if I may. So please note that at the bottom of your screen, uh, there is a QA and a uh, option. Uh, please, um, uh, during the presentations, uh, uh, remember to put all your questions there. What we're going to do uh, is uh, we're going to, uh, uh, to uh, well, I'm going to see the questions and read the questions and ask our speakers um, the questions um, that are there uh, at the end of the presentations. And then at the end of both presentations, uh, we are going to have um, 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 a joint uh, discussion of both the presentations that have been um, uh, given to us. Um, yes, I think without uh, further uh, delay, um, I would like uh, to invite our first uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Julia Kupina, who is the director of the Russian Museum of Ethnography 
um, to uh, talk to us about recollecting modern issues of ethnographic collecting in, uh, in Russia. So uh, the floor is yours, uh, Julia. Yeah, thank you very much, Alexandra and colleagues. And let me thank you the ICOM for invitation. It's really a great honor for me to share with you and with colleagues all over the world some thoughts which are on topic of discussions in Russia. And let me start uh, with a short story. In July of this year, the muse our museum received a letter from Mr. Bekov, a 70-year-old resident of one village in Kyrgyzstan who asked on the basis of the museum collections to perpetuate the name of his grandfather, Master Sumurzai. It was his works, on the opinion of the letter writer, that were acquired in 1940 uh, during the museum exposition to Kyrgyzstan. Those objects were published in the scientific article in 1968 with the caption, work of the local master. Bekov argued that the master was his grandfather, and the arguments were, everyone in our community knows that, and the originals of some objects by this master are kept in my family. <clears throat> our museum experts believe that this version can be added to the museum documentations we are in correspondence, but what is important? 80 years ago, the objects were acquired. 58 years ago, they were published. And today, in the place of origin of those objects, they are being studied and their interpretation analyzed. Those objects serve to restore the biography of persons, the history of the local family and community. The local people themselves initiate the collecting in this area and invite the museum to come to their place again. So the collecting is becoming a public process requiring communication, con correspondence, and development of personal contacts. Uh, this is a very important story which led us to see maybe deeply to what is going in Russia. Uh, we have a numerous number of museums which have so-called ethnographic collections and they are very widely spread over the country. The total number of museums is more than 3,000 and most, more than 60 of them have even in their term, in their title, the name ethnography or ethnographic. In the same catalogue of the museum collection, more than two million ethnographic items are now registered. What is important, and in Russia, there are maybe two very large and very old ethnographic museums. It's Kunstanera, which is 300 years old, and Russian Museum of Ethnography, which is 100, nearly 120 years old. What is very important, from the outset, the ethnographic collection in Russia were formed as scientific collections. The very first academic expeditions of the 18th century, they already had in their programs of acquisition, uh, in, in their programs, the acquisition of ethnographic uh, collections. The issues of acquisition, ZARS, are on discussion in Russia for 200 years uh, um, and a lot of, uh, scientists wrote about this. Today, many museums in our country are concerned with developing the concepts of accession of their collections, and notably, they are called scientific concepts of fund accession and are singled out as a special documents. Uh, in a lot of museums, ethnographical objects are set for a special uh, funds and uh, the ethnographic exhibitions are all over the country. But the main question is the same as several, as maybe a hundred years ago. What is an ethnographic collection and an ethnographic object? To make it clear, I will only speak about artifacts 
which form the core of the museum collection. Other aspects of collecting, which deals with fixation techniques, will remain beyond the scope of my presentation. To understand, to tr when we are trying to understand what is ethnographic uh, collection and uh, what does it mean to uh, collect uh, ethnographic items, uh, it is very important to start not from culture, to start not from artifact, but to start from the museum, uh, because uh, it is a because the functioning of the item in the museum environment is very, very important. The collection, uh, how, but and it is rather strange for us always, how can artifacts reproduce the culture from, the, from which they were extracted and how small part they are? The answer is surprisingly may be found if we will compare the museum space to a ritual space. Where the, uh, the, in the ritual space, usually the most valuable information is conveyed to objects. From the perspective of me for poetic views, objects do not fill the museum, but rather form and create it. For us, and that is why uh, the museum space is a high quality of variability and multivariance. It should be emphasized that the semantic field of an object as an exhibit will never fully coincide with the natural environment. Therefore, it is very important to stress that the ethnographicity of the object, sorry, the ethnographicity of an object is generated in the museum space and not just shows itself in it. That is why the meaning of collection objects in the museum is constantly expanding. It often happens that the collectors could not even have any idea of many aspects of interpretation and use of objects in the museum. The ethnographicity of an object is created in and by the museum. Building our ethnographic collections today, we do not only look on cultures and people outside the museum, but we have to look on our museums, their specific mission and social role. That is why the individuality of acquisition policies for each museum and even for each collector is very, very much important. Um, the here, on the screen, you may see just the main factors which affect the collecting in Russian ethnographic museum, as well as in a lot of museums in Russia and for sure in the world. Uh, but what is surprising, uh, the factors practically are the same all over the time. The functions of the museum are practically the same all over the time, such as preservation, study, and education. But uh, the selection of all uh, of is of object is always subjective. What we collect is not artifacts, but our constantly changing views of them. Exhibits are never free of concepts favored by the ethnographer. Each generation of research and museum visitors and each generation of curators, let's say they are liberators of objects from many previous concepts, but at the same time, they take them captive with their own concepts. The process become endless. The point is that um, I have illustrated in the uh, the story from the very, in the very start of my presentation. The acquisition today is a public process, which involves not only researchers, but local communities and wide public. And all of them are asking each other, what is ethnographic object? Uh, one of the criteria which may be useful for us and for sure is always useful for us, is everything related to the making of a thing. Time, place, material, technology, uh, 
it's a uh, uh, rather clear for us uh, that uh, the area of traditional technology is shrinking what we have to do so uh, the special point for sure is the item existence and the tradition may show itself not only in the outward lifestyle but also in the behavior in speech and that is why um, the ethnographicity of the theme is not only the theme itself but the human relations about the theme it is always broader than the material aspect. Therefore, it is reasonable to acquire a set of objects rather than isolated ones. Today, we may formulate the several trends in collecting of ethnographic material. They are on the screen, I will not name them. Uh, but those trends suggest that a decrease in physical material is balanced, but an increase in informative material. And it is not only because uh, the fixation techniques, but first of all, by shifting the researcher's focus. In particular, ethnography should be eager not only in the objects acquired, but also in the very process of their acquisition. This process of acquisition is becoming the process of special attention of ethnographers, and we feel through it a lot of nuances and overtones of the culture. In our days, the ethnog our ethnographer, which are going um, to the field, for instance, they are um, going to fulfill the several aims, which are also listed on the screen but what is obvious uh, today that the scientist does not for sure they do need professionalism and professional training but first of all the human qualities such as attention observation thoughtful uh, approach and a very good ability to build strong and good kind relations with the community they are in the priority and this is maybe it always have been such for ethnographer and in this scene i think that it's very important to see on the collecting of the ethnographic object uh, an ethnographic collection by ethnographers in the field because it's much more clearly possible to see the ethnical side of any collecting and it is difficult. Uh, oh, sorry. It is difficult because, uh, let's say, the moral and ethical issues of acquisition are also in the focus of the Russian traders. The scientific nature of ethnographic collections determines their basic feature. They are systematic, but uh it's for sure it sounds strange but anti-ethnicalness why because uh, science used to provide the indulgence for researchers and let them to um, take the items from their natural environment from point of view in science it's very it's uh, it's okay, but from point of view of the global harmony, it is anti-ethnical. And we may observe the process that uh, the more education uh, programs, the more public programs are deals with the accession, the more ethical it can be. So the main topic maybe and the main uh, point today is to make the acquisition of the collection the kind of public activity and uh, if we are talking today about the reconstructions of our exhibition reorganizations of our institutions the renovations of our storages rethinking of the whole role of the museums in the society i think that it is uh, necessary to talk about the recollecting as about the rethinking of all acquisition approaches and uh, 
the main topic today is uh, to not to replace the retrospective approach in collecting, but to add it with the relevant um, retrospective approach, which uh, because in some sometimes the researchers have to undertake a risk and to collect that ethnographicity is hidden and uh, they have to take a risk and to collect uh, information and items which do not just manifested the traditions, the diversity of the traditions, but um, uh, which may be hidden in those items, but in future will shape our museums. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julia. That was really, really interesting. I think that you raised a number of very important uh, um, issues here. Uh, this has been a great start for our conference. Uh, I cannot see uh, questions um, for, uh, for Julia. Um, please. Maybe, maybe later a uh, little. Yes, I have some. I have, I have already written my notes, so I will take the opportunity since I'm in this privileged position. But I just want to um, to let our, our participants, our attendees, know that um, please do um, go to the bottom of the of your screens. There is this Q and A uh, on the right, uh, and then uh, please uh, put your questions there, and I'll be um, uh, happy to share um, to share them, mm -hmm. and then we can uh, we can talk uh, about uh, all them. Um, Okay, um, so as I said, uh, since I'm in this uh, privileged position, I may uh, start with the questions. Um, uh, I, I was very interested in this idea of the ethnographicity um, of, of the objects. And I think that in this idea, um, you put many, uh, many interesting uh, notions. I was, I was wondering about um, the display. Do we, uh, do we display uh, these processes of acquisition? Do we create this eth uh, ethnographicity through uh, our exhibitions or um, it's just something that um, you know we do inside the museum so it's something that we need to to do inside first before we communicate it with the audience i think that exhibition is just a small, one kind of publications yeah mm -hmm. We just we may talk about the certain items and think about it publicity. We may publish it in our catalogs. We may use in our public programs on our website, and through museum usage of this object, we may create it ethnography ethnographicity. For instance, so this phone may be also interpreted for by us as ethnographical collection. Yeah, if we will put it inside our program in special contexts, because sometimes in our everyday life, um, it's, it's not possible uh, to, to see the ethnographicity of a certain items. We will not trace their relations with people. And um, in this, um, so, we are collecting not objects, the main idea is. We are collecting our ideas and our relations which are manifested in objects. So uh, that is why, uh, you know, today in our uh, old collections, we may observe, uh, we may do discoveries with the help of the old collections because it's not everything clear about them, about their relations with the collectors, with the museum, with the donators, and so on and so on. So the diversity of, uh, is, of collections is not only in items. Its diversity is in the, the documentation, in the interpretation, and uh, this is the diversity of information. And uh, information is a very unique source, uh, resource. If you will use any other resources, they will be smaller, smaller, and smaller. If we are using information, it is much more diverse and it's growing. That's why talking about the diversity, yeah, we are talking about a uh, dialogue. Diversity plus dialogue, they will burn 
a great amount of information. And we, the museum, have uh, uh, the responsibility and needs the courage to deal with this information is with all kinds of its interpretation. It's a very risky job <laughs> because you will never foresee <laughs> what kind of uh, interpretation you will face. You can't control it. If, yeah, so you just have to be ready to face it. And this is a trick of the museum job. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we have a question uh, from uh, our participants. Mikey Groffen is asking uh, about recollecting. Recollecting is an enormous job. Do you think that it has to be given priority over contemporary collecting or uh, can a museum do both at the same time? Uh, for sure, it's rather difficult to do both, but we have to. But we have to, to my opinion and to my experience, one of the most interesting uh, discoveries are made not in the field, they are made uh, in the storage. It's happened so in our museum. It's, they are done in, in the storage. The most successful collection and acquisition and the most bright acquisition are uh, for sure, it's some old items from the end of the 19th century. For instance, we managed to get a gift from an old lady in the far north of Russian Federation. She presented to the museum very old headdresses um, from his grand grandmothers. But is it possible to put the TV? Uh, to be set to the museum collection of ethnographic museum today. Is it possible or not? If we will, uh, the people just, uh, you know, are, uh, are thinking in a retrospective way and uh, it's very pity that we may lose a lot of information of today. Do not fix an object. Sometimes it's a discussion, you know, I maybe do not have certain answers. Because some people think, okay, we have a lot of uh, means of fixation. We may just document uh, a lot of things through, through photos, through video, and so on. But they think they have magic. They create the museums. You know, it's my strong belief, maybe because for a lot of, of my life, I work in the eldest ethnographic museum with a very rich collection. And the paradox of the museum and museum collecting is that you may change nothing, just nothing, but it will be changed because their society is changes, the understanding of exhibitions is changing. Uh, it's can't be, the situation in the museum can't be stable and that's why is recollecting. It's recollecting of our ideas, it's recollecting of our public and recollecting of objects for our collections. It's always, it's, I even say that it is an epoch of rare, rare doing in the museum just now. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, one, another question from the audience. Uh, In Kyung Chang uh, asks, could you elaborate on the terminology? Ethnographicity, is this a new term that you invented? Is this the methodology to interpret collections of ethnographic materials? Ethnographicity, yes, it's a new term which is widely used, for instance, in our museum between our curators because uh, this is a, not the material quality of a thing. Yeah, it's not just a cup or a phone or a traditional dress. It is the quality of its, uh, how does it depict the relations of their museum and the donator, uh, the relations of local people by whom was created with the first 
their environment and so on. It's, uh, we just can't find in Russia um, the term, one term, it's ethnographic quality or something like this, yeah? Uh, so ethnographicity, it's a quality of a thing which, why we just decided to put in, in our collection. Is it, it, does it have ethnographicity or not? So it's maybe called just a local slang of our museum. Uh, uh, well, it's, it, it's uh, so basically it's a term that you use in order to, um, to talk about whether uh, an object is not just worthy of collecting, but also worthy of, of displaying and of in general worthy of being in the uh, museum, even, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, because in Russia we have a very, you know, st uh, clear procedure how to include one or another item in our collection. There are a lot of commissions and experts who have to participate and the collector, the critic who suggests this for the museum. Uh, they, it's a lot of struggle, believe me. <laughs> Usually it's such a long commission, there's a lot, a lot of discussions. And the, and ethnogra the term ethnographicity was born especially in those uh, discussions during these commissions. When we are working uh, on exhibitions, we are doing it with the help of the museum objects which are already included in this. So it's not on this level that ethnographicity is discussed. It's usually discussed during the collecting, during the acquisition process. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I cannot see any other questions. So I will take advantage for one more, I think. Um, and then please uh, feel free if you have more questions to add them in the Q&A um, uh, part of the, of the communication of Zoom. Um, you mentioned the ethics uh, of collecting and you mentioned um, the, the, the non-ethical aspect of um, ethnographic collecting in relation to the natural environment. Would you like to expand a little bit more on that? Um, how do you exactly feel that ethnographic collecting is related to the natural environment and why there is an unethical um, issue or an issue of ethics there? You know, or my basic point is that all scientific collect collecting, all process of scientific acquisition and anti-ethnical, especially it is discussed uh, in, to the relation of the biodiversity collections. Yeah, you have to kill the animal to put it into collection. Yeah, you have to take flowers to put it into collection. It's rather clear on the example of the biodiversity collections, but not rather clear on the ethnographical collections. But you are coming to the certain place to collect items. And uh, for instance, several years ago, on the Baikal region, I faced with the situation when in a small village they have a very traditional cradle for babies and the only one and very ancient, very ancient and very typical for this area and very rare and for sure it was, I was very interested to take it to the museum but in this case this village will lose this item the tradition will stop what to do yeah so there are a lot of ethical questions yeah and sometimes uh, the collectors they knew the value of the item as a cultural heritage but the local but for the local people that are just ordinary objects what to do in this case so the answer is the process have to be public. And that is why there are a lot of publication through exhibition and catalog uh, of new acquisitions. They are on the screen, those new acquisitions, and we may discuss it with the local communities as much more widely. So collecting, scientific collecting, is ethical, yes. <laughs> Yes, because the harmony of the universe is destroyed. But we create the new harmony, the harmony of knowledge. 
and we have the point of uh, scientific um, of science or uh, the, the main character is that science can't exist without publicity science has to be public and the scientific acquisition has to be public so and we as a museum the secret and magic of the museum is that this institution is maybe the only one institution which may balance the anti-ethnical aspects of collecting and uh, with the public activities yeah and that's why to harmonize our you know activity uh, in preserving of culture so there are no maybe clear answers because we are balancing between several problem, pro, <laughs> problems all the time. And the individual answers on each case is very important. There can't be just a universe answer, what to do in a certain situation. Yeah, but from my point of view, it's rather important to understand the root problems on which we are standing. The ethnic-ethical nature of the scientific collection, which may be balanced by the public activities. And in this case, uh, the role of the museum in the society is very, very high, very important. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think that um, the question of ethics and the human quality that you mentioned, but also the relationship with society and, and how museums are social institutions in a way, uh, will be uh, also discussed by our next keynote speaker, Armando Perla. And it's my uh, great pleasure uh, to introduce Armando, who is the head of Human Rights Holocaust Museum in Montreal. And he is going to uh, talk to us about a moment of reckoning uh, on institutional racism um, well, a moment of reckoning on institutional racism is happening in museums. This is the title of his uh, presentation. Uh, as before, I encourage you to um, put your questions uh, there, uh, questions there in the Q&A. And afterwards, uh, you know, we can have the questions on Armando and have a general discussion as well. So Armando, um, uh, the floor is yours. If you would like to share the screen for the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. So here as well. Yes. So thank you and uh, good morning, good afternoon. And um, I would like to thank uh, Danielle Afanasi, Comcold, and Icon Russia for this invitation. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be here with you today. Um, before I start my presentation, I want to start by acknowledge that I am here today connecting from unceded indigenous lands. The Kanyeke Hakahaka Nation is uh, recognized as the custodians on the lands and the waters in which I am today. Teotihuacan, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations and is today the home of many indigenous people. Uh, so, thank you again. Um, yes, um, today, um, the way that I'm going to, um, to be presenting and the way that I'm going to be talking about is going to be divided in three parts. Um, first, I want to um, sort of focus on the, um, a bit of like theoretical framework of, um, you know, basic concepts on institutional racism, white supremacy, and some of the, the, the terminology that I'm going to be using throughout uh, the presentation. Then I, while I want to be looking at uh, different um, examples from around the world of this mobilization that are being led right now by um, Black, Indigenous, uh, and other people of color museum workers um, calling out museums for um, fostering uh, racism or other types of oppression. And then lastly, I'm going to be focusing on some examples of good practice as well. Um, the reason why I chose this topic uh, in relation to the conference today is because I think it is very fitting. I think that we are at a moment where we have to really rethink in the way that we are doing uh, museum work 
uh, collecting. I think these mobilizations that are taking place around uh, different parts of the world today are a sign that the system that we have in place today, the sector, um, hasn't really worked out for historically marginalized communities. Um, in my presentation today, I'm going to be focusing on, uh, I'm going to be looking at it through a race uh, lens, but uh, this is uh, not necessarily the only um, oppression that I'm going to be talking about. Like a lot of uh, what I'm <clears throat> going to be referring to, it's also going to apply to other types of oppression um, that have to do with uh, sexual orientation, ability, gender, sex, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, with that, I want to start uh, with a light topic, <laughs> white supremacy. So, and uh, when I talk about white supremacy here and the way that I'm going to be referring to it throughout the presentation, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, the image that we have about the KKK. Like this is not the white supremacy that I'm talking about. It's something that is much more subtle. So Jamaican scholar uh, and philosopher Charles uh, Mills uh, tells us that white supremacy is the unnamed political system that has made the modern, the modern world what it is today system of European global domination, bringing into existence whites and non-whites, full persons and self-persons. So of course, these are all um, artificial categories, right, that have been created by this system of uh, white supremacy. Some of Europe's uh, greatest thinkers, uh, he tells us, um, contributed to the development of this presumption, and it eventually encompassed everything from the superiority of their form of government to the greater reason of their minds, and even the beauty of their bodies. This is really important in relation as well to the work of museums, uh, because these are many of the standards that we hold and that we also uh, further in the work that we do. Um, they were merely uh, worked uh, fantasies posing as fact, but they were eventually learned as the truth that enabled Europeans to assert that they had the right to take over the lands, lives, and power of those they had decided where the lesser breeds. So this part that I have um, underscored here, uh, it is the basis of colonialism, right? Like it is the taking of those lands, the power, the lives, and the wealth of other uh, nations. And this is what has created the world in which we live in today. So white supremacy is at the base of colonialism. This is, uh, well, been expressed by many, many different thinkers, uh, you know, and scholars. Uh, but here I'm just highlighting uh, the words of uh, Maori lawyer and indigenous rights expert Moana Jess. Um, colonialism and museums, what uh, Hot Chunk uh, scholar Amy Lone Tree uh, also tells us that museums can be very painful sites for native peoples as they are intimately tied to the colonization process. So this is interesting, right? Because I mean, and I would not say only for native people, museums are painful, but they are painful for many historically marginalized communities. Because exactly as uh, Amy Lone tells us, they are tied to that colonization process. Um, universities and uh, museums are those two institutions that came out of the colonial project and they were, well, created, they were founded so that they could uh, cement this colonial way of thinking, but also not only cemented, but also expanded it throughout the world. Um, so yeah, institutional racism. Um, institutional racism is a form of racism that is subtler and less identifiable than overt racism in terms of specific individuals committing the acts. This is, uh, these are the words of, uh, Stokely uh, Carmichael, who is uh, an African-American who was also civil rights uh, movement activist. Um, so yeah, again, like we're not talking about overt racism, although sometimes it does happen as well in museums, but um, this is again, you know, like white supremacy, it's something that is much more subtle, right? Like something that sometimes we cannot easily identify, uh, unless of course you have experienced it yourself and then you're very aware to it. Um, so this is a photo of a study that came out recently uh, that was done by um, Sean O'Neill, who is a Canadian who decided to study um, the diversity or lack of diversity uh, in uh, senior positions in the four major mu art museums in Canada. So this photo that you see here, it's all of the senior, it's all of the CEOs, it's all board members, and it's all the executives 
from all museums, from all those four art, the major art museums in Canada. So like pretty much everyone, as you can see, is white. So this is, you know, another way that institutional racism will manifest itself as well, particularly in the museum world. Um, and yes, so just to um, also stressed here uh, what institutional racism is. Uh, this is something that came out from uh, a report on or investigation on Stephen Lawrence's death in the UK. Um, so institutional racism basically is the collective failure of an organization to provide an appropriate and professional service to people because of their color, culture, or ethnic origin. It can be seen or detected in processes attitudes and behaviors which amount to discrimination through unwitting prejudice, ignorance, thoughtlessness, and racist stereotyping, which disadvantage minority ethnic people. Unwitting racism can, can arise because of lack of understanding, ignorance, or mistaken beliefs. It can arise from well-intentioned but patronizing words or actions. It can arise from unfamiliarity with the behavior or cultural traditions of people or families from minority, minority ethnic communities. Often this arises out of a critical self-understanding born out of an inflexible police ethos of the traditional ways of doing things. So I think this is uh, particularly interesting as well for us in museums, right? Because we, uh, or museum professionals, are trained in a way that tells us this is the way that things are done traditionally, right? Like I'm not saying that's the case for everything, for everyone, but uh, traditionally these are uh, these are what we're learning as well at university, which, you know, again, university is also born out of that colonial project. Um, museums and races. So consciously or not, many who staff museums and galleries have been trained and socialized to think and known in those ways. A reminder that museums are not set apart from global injustices and the realities of racial conflict and prejudice encounters between museum professionals and external individuals, particularly those from diaspora communities, still bear traces of colonizer meeting colonized. So this is, uh, you know, from uh, an article by Bernadette Lynch and Samuel uh, Alberti. Um, I also chose this image here because it is the Linnaeus uh, Museum in Sweden. Uh, just to, you know, again, to tie it back to uh, how museums uh, and uh, academic uh, Thought have contributed to further again um, these ideas and in, in, in institutional racism and racism, right? Like Linus, as we know, was a botanist, was a zoologist, a physician who is credited for having um, sort of like um, structured uh, the way in which we classify, um, you know, uh, things today or, or organisms today. Also, something that is not uh, very talked about is that he is uh, the person who um, also created uh, those artificial race categories, which, you know, we still think that, you know, um, exist today and that separate people, which, you know, he divided people in uh, four races, right, or five, I think, four, uh, being uh, white, red, yellow, and black. And he attributed also characteristics uh, that were, you know, to some of them, being lazy to some of them, being lustful, some of them being based on, you know, ruled by law, some other ones ruled by opinions and, you know, this type of stereotypical ideas, right? So this is, again, uh, something that um, colonial thought has uh, put forward. And, uh, and it's something that affects the way in, in the function today. Um, so in the last, I guess, concept that I want to um, highlight as well and bring to the forefront here is uh, the concept of white fragility, which is a concept that was coined by uh, sociologist uh, Robin D'Angelo. Um, she uh, tells us that white fragility is a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of offensive moves. These moves include the outward display of emotions such as anger, fear, and guilt, and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and leaving the stress-inducing situation. These behaviors, in turn, function to reinstate white racial equilibrium. So this is something that, um, you know, many of us who are racialized uh, know uh, very well that when we start talking about race, when we start talking about white uh, supremacy and all of these things, these terms will make white people very uncomfortable. 
and we will face a reaction, which a lot of the times uh, it's not going to be good for us. Um, so if you translate all of this into the museum world, um, when we are talking about, for example, you know, uh, as you mentioned, uh, ethical ways of collecting, let's say, diversity here in quotation marks, right? Um, or collecting um, the, you know, material culture or uh, intangible heritage of these historically marginalized communities. When we who come from uh, this historically marginalized community start trying to um, talk inside of museums on how we need to do this ethically on or how we should be doing this ethically and whatnot. And uh, we start touching upon all of these different concepts and these different um, terminologies and issues, we often face these reactions, right? This resistance. And we find ourselves in um, situations that often cause harm. So this is what has led us to what we're seeing in many different parts of the world. Uh, and all of these different mobilizations taking place around uh, museums and the way that they have um, treated people from historically marginalized communities. Like I said, I'm going to be looking at this from um, a race lens, but this is also intersectional because there are many different oppressions that you cannot separate from uh, each other, right? And they are um, intersecting in, 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 in many places. Um, so I will start with, uh, well, situating this example from around the world here in Canada, because it is where I am and it's also because where I have taken part uh, on. And so this photo that you see here, it's uh, on the background, you see the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, which has been uh, under a lot of controversy, uh, you know, all across, um, well, all, all around the summer, right? Um, so what you're seeing here is a protest that um, drew thousands of people to uh, the museum in support of uh, Black Lives Matter, or and this was organized by uh, Justice for Black Lives, uh, Justice for Black Lives in Winnipeg. Um, so, like I said, this uh, manifestation drew thousands of people who started at the legislative building in Manitoba in Winnipeg, and they all marched to end, uh, you know, the museum. The Human Rights Museum, um, the day after, uh, the, the, the marches took place on June 5th, which was Breonna uh, Taylor uh, birthday. So the day after, the museum started using some of those photos, those images, and, you know, putting them in their social medias, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and whatnot. So this uh, did not turn out well for the museum because, um, Tiana Diop, who is a former employee of the museum, um, started to share her own experience of anti-Black racism inside of the museum. Um, this is a hashtag, this is another social media campaign that was created by Napan de Londe, who is a Black woman from Winnipeg, who created this hashtag, it happens in Winnipeg, to show people that um, this uh, discrimination and racism isn't just a problem from the U.S. Because what she experienced during that march that I showed the image at the beginning is that she felt that most of the uh, non-Black people who were there, they thought they were there in support of uh, the marches that were taking place in the United States without thinking that this is something that happens here in Canada. So she created this uh, hashtag and people started to share their own experiences of anti-Black racism in uh, in Canada, in Winnipeg. And so, like I said, one of the former and Black former employees of uh, the Human Rights Museum uh, share uh, her own experiences of um, anti-Black racism in the museum. So this originated a response from the museum, right? The museum said that um, they were acknowledging uh, that other, uh, you know, that people had experienced these instances of racism because when um, Tiana started sharing her experience, there were also other current and former black employees of the museum who also started to share their experiences of racism inside of the museum. So it wasn't just one employee anymore, but it was a few of them. Um, and so this started to come out. And so the museum responded and they responded with, you know, a lot of words, uh, a lot of them not being very genuine. 
Uh, for example, uh, you know, one of these things that really uh, shook, uh, shook me were, uh, you know, when the museum says that as an institution dedicated to human rights, the museum seeks to amplify those voices, but it's also the museum responsibility to listen when it, issues are raised about its own practices and take action to address them. This really, you know, like I, I saw this post in the social media from the museum and it really outraged me because I work in that museum as a curator for almost 10 years and I raised constant issues of racism, of, you know, homophobia, of all different kinds of oppression in there that I was experiencing and I was, um, not only not amplified, but I was uh, the target of many other um, attacks. So I responded to that as well. And I responded with some of my own personal stories about what I had experienced inside of the museum. Um, you know, I, at that moment, I hadn't realized that Tiana had also shared her own experience. And then uh, when we started to see this, because the museum put this out very publicly, and then we started to realize that more and more current and former employees of the museum started to share their own stories. So that's when we decided, okay, we need to join forces. And then uh, Tiane had created this new hashtag, the hashtag CMHR stop lying. And then we all started to put our stories under that hashtag because the, it happens in Winnipeg was just for black people. And this was all for, um, you know, black indigenous and people of color, not only black people. So we started to do this and dozens of employees, like I said, current and former employees have started to share their own stories um, about many types of oppression, including uh, racism. So this is uh, the, this is uh, Tiana right at the center and uh, to her right is uh, Julie White, who is also an indigenous uh, former employee of the museum who also experienced um, racism in there. These are some of uh, the t-shirts that uh, Tiana created for the campaign. And this is a, uh, another, um, protests that took place uh, in front of the museum. So what you see on the background uh, is the amphitheater from the Canadian Museum for, uh, for Human Rights. So, like I said, dozens and dozens of employees started to share all of this. This prompted the museum to acknowledge some of the wrongdoings that they had done and also to start an investigation uh, on an independent investigation. And I say independent because still it was the museum that drafted the terms in the contract. And so they also put no accountability in, in, in that investigation, right? So, but the investigation took place and also, like I said, more stories kept coming of sexual abuse, harassment, homophobia, racism. And uh, all of this, of course, all of these mobilizations also led to uh, the CEO having to step down. Uh, this is one small step. Like I said, this is uh, still an ongoing process um, that we're still dealing with. And we are, uh, again, still talking, talking with the government and with you know the, the people doing the investigation and all of this. This is an offer. This is still a long process. Uh, and it will be a long process of reconciliation, reparation, and all of that. But, with all of this, uh, what happened is that this was one case. Then we started to see many other cases of other institutions in Canada as well, and other employees who were, you know, racialized, who were from the LGBTQ plus community, also starting to come forward about their own uh, instances in a bunch of other museums, right? I think right now we have about 10 different museums that have been called out for uh, either their human rights abuses or, or because of uh, the lack of diversity in their leadership uh, positions or in just you know, their museums in general, the people working there. So these are just some of the headings from news and everything from the museums that have been called out here in Canada. Um, I mean, this is still happening, right? Um, in the U.S., like this is not, this, you know, this is that's happened is not only exclusively to Canada. This has also happened in the U.S. I'm sure a uh, few of you have seen uh, the Instagram account change the museum that, you know, today has 34,000, over 34,000 followers and hundreds of 
testimonies from uh, black indigenous and people of color workers who have testified of their um, abuses that they've been exposed to in almost every uh, art museum in uh, TQS, major art museums. So you also see also the pro proliferation of other uh, Instagram accounts like um, Council um, Art Galleries for the Culture, who are also doing similar work and people of color, uh, LGBTQ people, all these people from historically marginalized communities are sharing more and more uh, their testimonies. So these are also some of the uh, other headlines from uh, the news in the US. Um, we've seen, I think so far, I've tracked about 20 individual museums that have received uh, specific media coverage. Uh, the ones before, like I said, um, with the Instagram accounts, people posting uh, anonymously, um, it's hundreds. And you know, and it's like, like I said, almost every museum in the US has been called out because of this instance of racism. But there is also very particular and very incredible campaigns of mobilization led by BIPOC and LGBTQ uh, former and current museum workers. And these are some of those examples, which I find very inspiring as well. Um, in the UK as well, we have seen uh, similar instances, the British Museum, the Tate Museum, uh, the London South Bank Centre as well, have been uh, also called out for their uh, shallowness in their statements of support of Black Lives Matter, but also uh, for the lack of diversity and for also violating the rights of historically marginalized and excluded groups and communities. Um, and like this is, you know, also uh, happened in Australia, and also in um, Argentina as well. Uh, we've been seeing this coverage you know, from Argentina just a couple of weeks ago. Um, we've still seen uh, museums being called out. Again, like last week, we saw you know, uh, the whole controversy around the Whitney Museum in New York. So this is something that is still started early uh, June and we're still seeing it today that people continue to feel empowered enough to still be able to talk about what has happened. So ICOM, also, you know, has had its own um, share of controversy around these um, ideas of, of what a museum is, what a museum should be doing, what the definition of a museum is, right? So we saw it in Kyoto, um, and I was quite, uh, you know, surprised and taken aback when we were in Kyoto, and I was seeing all of these discussions taking place, and I saw country of this, you know, big, powerful, mostly white countries who, you know, going forward and saying and during those definition debates, we are already doing this work that this definition, you know, is telling us that we need to do. We don't need this or we need more time uh, to implement it. Uh, this is, you know, creating a false division between progressives and conservatives in ICOM and this and that, which I thought was really interesting because like I said, I knew back then, you know, in September a year ago, that this isn't the case, that most museums aren't doing this work, that most museums aren't really, you know, uh, uh, trying to share power, that most museums are still working in the very traditional ways that are coming out from um, colonialism that, you know, we saw at the beginning of the presentation, right? So to me, that was, um, that was really interesting. And yes, you know, like, I'm not saying that the proposed definition was perfect. Of course, it has many flaws, but it was a good start and it was a good statement on what museums should be doing, right? And, and the fact that most ICOM members uh, did not want to even vote on it, it just, you know, it, it to me is just a reflection of the need for something like this because now that we're seeing everything that has happened this summer, and the disconnect that you know, museums are having with the protection of rights, like many of the values and the things that this new definition proposed, I think you know, it, is, it makes sense of why uh, this definition was important. Because of course, you know, there was a lot of fear in having to change things and having to change the way that you work. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, again, just to bring it back a little bit to, um, to ICON, which is where we are. So this, uh, you know, what I am now talking about, like trying to like, again, you know, bring some uh, examples of practice. Um, this is what I call a human rights-based museum practice. To me, 
uh, a human rights-based museum practice, which is also inspired from a human rights-based approach, of course, that has been used in many different areas and sectors of, uh, of our world. Um, what they do, what most of these human rights-based approaches try to do is they try to pri prioritize the meaningful participation uh, and empower empowerment of historically marginalized pop populations. Um, what they also try to do is they try to address discriminatory, discriminatory practices and the unequal distribution of power. I have, of course, put in here museums because I'm applying these human rights human rights-based uh, approach to museum practice. So the unequal distribution of power is something that we have seen is at the root cause of what has led us to where we are today. So what does uh, this human rights-based museum practice mean? It means as well that we need to challenge the status quo, that we need to advocate for the repre representation of historically marginalized groups at all levels of governance and encourage institutional self-reflection on implicit biases, racism, and different forms of privilege inherent in museum practice. So this is something that um, I've been trying to implement in different places where I have worked and um, at different levels. Uh, and of course, there's always resistance. There is always, you know, like the fight back. They're like, why do we need to do things in a new way? Why do we need, to, like, you know, this is the way, like, you know, like Bernard Lynch, uh, and Sam uh, already said, like this is the ways that most museums professional have been trained and this is the way that we have done things for the longest time. So it is interesting, you know, well, not interesting, but it is, uh, it is telling when uh, we try to do things in a different way that we get all this resistance, which also connects back to, you know, again, like this whole white fragility notion that, you know, is being coined by uh, Robin D'Angelo. So, this is here some of the examples that I think are doing amazing uh, things, you know, in other parts of the world, um, in where I think power is shared with the different communities. I mean, you don't even see this difference of like, oh, it's not even like sharing power. It's, you know, it's, these museums are being led by these communities that have been historically excluded, right? So this is um, a museum, it's a community museum that exists in, uh, town in a, in a village uh, called Huejotzingo in Mexico, it's very close to Puebla. They are uh, a, a museum that has been created by youth from the town. So this town is the town where um, the largest carnival in Mexico takes place. Uh, so the Carnaval de Huejotzingo. And the youth were so concerned that um, their elders um, are passing away and they are taking with them that knowledge, the traditional knowledge of the carnival. So they wanted to preserve that, right? Like, and so they started oral history projects. They started to connect with different um, artists that, you know, create all the costumes and these things and collecting. This is, you know, again, when we go to the collecting, right? And how we're thinking of collecting and how we can collect this diversity. So they started to collect all of these different things related <clears throat> to the carnival. This practices, this way of knowing, this way of doing things that they started to collect and that they started to create, you know, programs for the children in their town. Basically, the museum is the town. They have connected with so many artists, you know, they have created murals on the streets. You walk, you, uh, you walk in the streets of this town and you see the museum being alive on the streets. They created this, you know, one, they took one of their homes, one of their houses, and they also put photos that they, you know, <clears throat> collected from going through different archives in universities. They have connected with people. Now we, I, I was able to connect with people in Sweden as well. They're looking for, get, you know, from fo photos from some Swedish, uh, you know, people who went and did some research in there. So they, they doing really amazing work and they're really impacting the way that the town has uh, really felt about the carnival, right? So they're also like working with this sense of pride. They've been, they went door to door knocking on all of these, you know, people in the town, getting to know uh, new people, finding like lost relatives that they didn't even know they had. They got everyone on board to be part of this project, right? So this museum has become the town's museum and it is led by this. And I think this is a way, like I said, because they have involved everyone in this collecting, not just of, objects, but artifacts, but also of ways of doing and, um, and traditional ways of knowledge as well. So this is um, 
this is one of, I think, the best examples for me of, of how you can do this amazing uh, type of work in collecting and sharing of power. Um, so of course here we have photos of uh, District 6 Museum, which I also think in South Africa, which I think is one of uh, the best museums out there as well in terms of um, sharing power. Uh, here's Bodita Bennett, who is no longer, uh, you know, the museum director, but she did an amazing work, Chris, who is uh, the director of uh, collections, um, who does an amazing work working together with, and I mean, the people leading this museum are people who were also uh, forcibly removed from that neighborhood, right? So they're also part of this community. This is one of the few museums when I was, you know, working in South Africa that I found that were led by uh, people of color. And, and this is really amazing. And of course, that, that makes a huge difference, right? In the way that they care for the collection, in the way that create those collections together with former neighbors from uh, District 6. So yeah, this is, uh, again, another of those examples that for me, are at the forefront of how we should be working and doing um, museum work, which would prevent us from, you know, uh, having to face all of these things that we've been seeing come out to light uh, in this summer. This is another uh, great example that I also love um, and that I collaborated with as well is the Museum of Antioquia in Medellin, Colombia. They are uh, situated in a very conservative um, society, very Catholic, very religious, and this and that. And they have been working, the people inside of the museum, because they also have people, you know, from the LGBT community working there. Uh, they have an amazing uh, trans uh, curator, Julian Zapata, who has opened up spaces in the museum for uh, the trans community, the sex worker community, the BDSM community to come and work inside of the museum. What um, Julian, uh, what she's doing is that uh, she is collecting uh, ephemeral uh, practices and performances. So he creates a space that is called La Consentida and brings members, you know, from, like I said, all these different communities that um, they, she's working with into the space, they create performances, they create um, a space that is welcoming, that is uh, warm, that is not um, judging or anything. And uh, they have, um, <clears throat> oh, am I running out of time? Uh, and, no, no, no problem, please continue. Uh, okay, sure. Uh, and so, yes, so like I was saying, um, this has been amazing because it's not only um, creating this collection of uh, you know, performances and practices and, you know, dances and um, creating bars and discotheques inside of the museum, basically, but it's also bringing all these communities that before did not feel welcome inside of the museum. They are, you know, they, they love this museum now. They are uh, the ones leading tours. They're the ones interpreting the artworks on the walls. They're the ones going into the collections and choosing what's going to be play and why. Um, they open a series of windows on the back of uh, the museum, which now, you know, serve for the street vendors outside on the street to be able to tell people of what they're seeing inside of the museum as well. Like this is, like I said, again, another of those examples to me that are doing some of the most amazing work out there when it comes to um, inclusion and to uh, collecting, you know, if I can say diversity, but it's not even collecting, it's just like working and merging and being one with diversity, right? And um, I guess my last example um, that I wanted to share as well is also in Medellin, and it's this very small space that, you know, sometimes like when it's a gallery, right? Like it, it's not even a museum, but it's a gallery that it's, it's called Diva's Gallery, also, you know, working uh, with uh, the sex workers community. Um, the, it was this gallery, it's a, gallery, it's a bar in a gallery, as an exhibition space, but a performance space as well. Um, it was, it opened in, uh, in a brothel, basically, you know, and they were there and they were opening, you know, like they were interacting and they're all the different members of the community came and became engaged and they started as well, to, you know, part of uh, the way that they were displaying the art and things. And uh, they're also working not only uh, with the sex workers community, but they're also working with trans uh, communities, but indigenous trans communities. So you have all of these different layers of intersectionality as well taking place. And this is one of my favorite places, you know, in Medellin, which is also in a very um, challenging area. It's one of the most violent areas in Medellin, downtown Medellin, 
but they have made this space so popular and so welcome and the way you know that they're working that people from all over the city come here to their openings and to take place people from you know like all over the world like basically come here like when i was there last time there were people from europe from like you know north america uh looking at uh the way that they're working and how they're engaging with these populations that have been historically excluded and have not taken part in the work that we do in museums, right? So um, yes, so I just want to wrap up with, uh, with that and saying that uh, sometimes these spaces don't fit. And, and this is very common because, for example, for this Divas Gallery, for uh, the first example that I show from Huejotzingo, many times they've been told, well, you're not a museum. You don't, you know, fit within that definition of a museum that ICOM says, you know, that a museum should be. But they are doing some of the most amazing work out there. And to me, these are the leading examples of how museums, the museum of the future, will be working and how the museum of the future will have to work if they want to stay relevant uh, to the society in which they uh, exist. So thank you. Thank you very much, Armando. That was really, really interesting and very inspiring, I think, for everybody. Um, so uh, I have already uh, a couple of questions for you. Uh, and I would like to encourage everybody to um, uh, put their questions on the Q&A uh, um, uh, box so that uh, we can then um, share them with Armando. Also, maybe um, uh, we would like to um, uh, have a, a discussion uh, after the first questions. Um, um, uh, with uh, Julia as well and, and see how um, you know your talks uh, meet because I think that there are many uh, points that uh, you both raise that are really really interesting and they sort of um, uh, you know bring these two um, uh, presentations together but let me first uh, ask you the other questions I have um, question uh, first uh, could you please uh, um, uh, say again the name uh, of the museum in Colombia because uh, uh, one of our um, of our attendees um, um, says that um, they couldn't get it? Oh yeah, so uh, it's the Museum of Antioquia. And that's the name of the province where Medellin is located. So the city is Medellin and the province is Antioquia. Thank you very much for that. Then the question is, um, the examples that you shared with us are uh, mostly examples from uh, small institutions. Uh, how can bigger institutions, um, um, you know, uh, introduce more um, power sharing um, uh, practice, a more power sharing practice? So, you know, what could you suggest to bigger institutions? Um, you know, the Museum of Antioquia, actually, it's the second largest museum, I think, in Colombia and the country. So it's... Um, it's, it's uh, yeah, I was trying to put like a mix of like, you know, big and small institutions. Um, but yeah, it is always a challenge when it's a bigger institution because there is all of this um, layers, right, that you have to go through. And it is some of the things that I was speaking about at the beginning, right, when you find this sort of uh, resistance, um, it's difficult because it does take very specific type of people working inside of those institutions to advocate for uh, this methodology and for these ways of doing. And that usually takes a big toll on the person doing that work. So for me, recommendations for institutions to be able to do uh, this is to really take a look, uh, a critical look to themselves, to the institution and to um, think beyond just bringing also um, people from diversity, right, or from this historical through the communities to try to do this work, but to start to change um, institutional. I think if there is no will in the institution to bring about change, it's going to be very difficult to implement this uh, types of uh, work. I mean, the Museum of Antioquia, like I said, it is a big museum, but it has a very progressive director that is very supportive of of this type of practices, right? I think if you do not have support uh, at all levels of the institution, it's going to be very hard. And I think it has to start by uh, making that shift in the mentality of uh, how most museums work. And I wish I would have, you know, like uh, easy examples and easy ways of saying that we can make this work for big museums, but unfortunately, 
I, uh, I have struggled myself, you know, with a lot of this in the past and, and it is just not, not easy. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the, the way uh, I understand um, your argument, and I agree uh, completely with it, is that, you know, we have been talking about how museums can reinterpret their collections. And I think that this is something that um, uh, Julia also pointed out quite clearly, that it's time of recollecting in the sense that we need to reconsider, uh, you know, how everything happened into the institution, but also is a question of reconsidering how the institution itself has been structured and, and you know, so not think just from inside out, but also the other way around and, and sort of reconfigured where we are. We have one uh, question by Lynn, uh, Lynn Bayers. Uh, sharing power, overcoming hopefully institutional racism, how does this affect collecting or how can collecting be contributing to that? Yeah, so collecting, it's great it can also be very harming, right? Because sometimes there's a lot of very extractivist practices that we have in museums that we want to go and we want to bring, uh, you know, these objects that belong to communities um, that, uh, you know, but I'll go back a little bit. For example, you know, um, in my practice, uh, when I have engaged and talked with a lot of these different communities, particularly indigenous communities, um, and we talk about a lot of the material culture that they have, right? Um, they say, well, we don't trust museums. We don't want to give our objects away because in the past, museums have taken them without our consent. They are still, hold there's still many museums who hold, you know, these objects um, and they're not giving them back. So this is a way that collecting has historically, um, you know, perpetuated racist practice, racism, but also has uphold white supremacy, right? Um, so I think collecting is a really good way to start building bridges with communities as well, because something that I have also experienced is that once people, and this is again going back to the ethics, right? When people see that forefront First and foremost, you're going to talk about how you're going to do this ethically. People will start to trust, right? And people will start to listen. I mean, tr building trust takes a long time, but this is the first step. When you show, you know, to these communities and you reverse the burden of proof that you as an institution, you're going to prove that you are going to work differently, that you're going to collect differently, then you start building something new, right? You start building that trust. And to me is this, it's also understanding that as museums, as much as we love to collect, sometimes it's not good to collect. And sometimes communities are there. They, like I said, they want to keep their objects. They want to keep their culture. They want to preserve their ways of doings. Museums have the knowledge on how to do this. Museums have the knowledge on how to collect, how to preserve, how to archive. Museums can share this knowledge with communities without the need of bringing those objects into the museums. So there can be partnerships that are created, right? And there are, there are museums already doing this. Um, and this is something that I think has had really good results. And you know, collecting, just, share, just start to think about collecting um, outside of just the action of extracting and bringing inside of the museum, but collecting in a way of a practice and how you can share that practice, how you can share that knowledge as well. That I think to me is where collecting can bridge these gaps. Thank you very much. Uh, a redefinition of collecting, uh, um, a, a reconsideration of collecting. I think that this is, this is really, really important and, and you know, very powerful. Thank you very much. Can I uh, also ask something um, regarding, um, I, I, I know that uh, you worked in Malmo, uh, if I pronounce it correctly, my Swedish is not good, uh, um, uh, in Migration Museum. Um, do you want to, to say to us a little bit about your practice there maybe? Yes, exactly. And I think, you know, I, I was just going to say that because um, Malmo was a really good example of, of doing this, right? And, and one of the things that we heard because this is a new museum. It's a national museum that is going to be built in Sweden, in Malmo. And uh, for this, during the process, um, we went across the country asking people why it was important to have a museum like this, how the museum should work, you know, all these basic things, right? And a lot of what we heard is that people told us, 
is um, we want this museum to tell our stories. We want to see all, all, all of these untold stories of democracy and migration, because it's both migration and democracy, this museum, and say, you know, we as migrants, we have contributed to Swedish democracy, and those stories haven't been told. So because people kept talking about stories, you know, we sort of came to this conclusion um, that oral history was probably a good way of collecting you know, those stories, right? And this is something that I did at the Human Rights Museum. I worked a lot with oral history, and this is a lot of how I collected as well um, different human rights stories. And so uh, we again passed all of this by uh, different groups and communities in, in Sweden, and um, they also were in agreement that oral history would be a good way of collecting and doing this work. So because oral history is also very tied to ethics, right? And oral history can also create a lot of harm if, it's not, if it is not done ethically and responsibly, something that we as a museum, as an institution, well, you know, very small in the birth and you know, embryonic period of this institution, something that we decided is that before we could even start collecting is that we were going to develop uh, the ethical guidelines of how to collect oral histories. And this is, you know, what I was talking about when I said, when you show up uh, with this, you know, groups and communities and you tell them I'm here because I want to listen how you think that we should collect ethically and responsibly this is going to start opening doors right so we put a lot of um, our focus and effort in the last two years into um, trying to figure out a way to create these ethical guidelines so we brought for example uh, to Malmo 35 um, different experts and when I say experts I'm bringing, I'm putting all together and at the same level, academics, museum professionals, and community members. So this is also, you know, a way of challenging those hierarchies that are, you know, embedded in museums and also um, universities. So we brought 35 experts who were working on these issues uh, from communities, like I said, uh, universities and museum sector, from the neighborhood where, uh, that temporary space that the museum has in Malmo is located from that neighborhood, from the city of Malmo, from Sweden, and from about five different continents from around the world. And all these experts, all of them, even if they were academics, even if they were museum professionals or community, they all as well belong to historically excluded communities. So we had people, you know, from the trans community, we had indigenous people from different parts of the world, from New Zealand, from Canada, from Sweden. We had uh, black people working as well in these issues in museums, people living with HIV AIDS, people from the LGBT community, all of us coming together to create this first draft document for the ethical guidelines, which is still in process, right? So, but yes, so we came up with a first draft, which was wonderful after three days of um, being together with this group uh, and um, separating the museum work. Because at the end of the day, what we realized as well, and sorry if I get like, you know, too, you know, I, I talk too much about this, yet. it's a very exciting project, but, um, what we realized is that this ethical guidance shouldn't only be for the collecting of oral history, but should also be applied to all of the ways in which the museum worked. And all of this again went back to you know that you know human rights based sort of like museum practice, right? Uh, but also in, um, in um, but complemented by also bringing other um, things that human rights doesn't really have, right? Which is kind of like this critical lenses, intersectionality, and you know, all of those other. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question from Alina Gram Gramova. Community collaboration is not always easy. Can you think of some examples of failure in this field? Yes, community <laughs> collaboration is never easy, right? And uh, you know, and, and and I love when I work with uh, my dear friend uh, Marilia Bonas, you know, from Brazil. She always says. You know, when you're working with communities, she's like, when I start working with communities, she says, I always go and I always tell everyone, you know, we're all gonna leave from here unhappy because no one is gonna get everything that they want. And that's a good thing, right? Because if you do live with whatever you want, then it means there's no compromises. It means there is no, um, that balance that you can reach, like that sharing of power, right? And so I think 
some of the lessons from working with communities and the difficulties that you find is that every community is different. There is no one monolithic, you know, like community. Also, there are inside of communities, there's also all these different fragments and separations and sometimes tensions as well within communities. And all of this has to be taken into consideration, right? And I mean, you cannot expect a group of people that you work, the group of people that you're working with from what community to represent every member of that community. So I think that's really key as well and never to expect them or ask them to speak on behalf of the whole group. Like that's just, that is just a recipe for disaster. So I think that is a really good advice from my experience. But it also is try to always listen to different layers because also when you start working with communities, initially what you're going to get is that top layer, right? And usually that top layer of leadership from the community is going to be men. And you want to have other perspectives. So this is also something, you know, that I, I always try to do, which is why I love working with oral history and again, doing the collecting with oral history, because once you go and you start doing oral history, and I always propose oral history projects, you know, to like communities and see, and usually people love it. And also, or sometimes communities, they just want, they, they come and they propose that oral history project. And I think it's a really great way of doing it because once you start doing those oral histories and you start to get to talk to all the different layers, of the community, right? You're not just talking to the leaders, but you start talking to young people, you start talking with women, you start talking with people who are from the LGBTQ you know, population from that community, you start to get all these different perspectives as well. And to me, something that I found very useful is to always leave the projects that I'm working with open. So once you know you start to listen from all this oral history, all the meetings, right, all of the dinners, the barbecues that you share with the communities, when you start to listen all of these other um, priorities that are not your priorities but are the community priorities, you can still go and change and shift and adapt that project together with uh, the voices that you're working with. But yeah, lots of challenges. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for that. I think that, um, Julia, um, you also mentioned, um, uh, you know, the, the issues of ethics, obviously, uh, and also the, um, the importance of dialogue and the importance of um, the human, I, I mean, I've, I've written it down because I, I like this phrase very much, um, the human quality, uh, which is important, which I, I think is it's uh, in a different way, this human, human rights or human-centered uh, uh, approach. I don't know if you uh, if you would like to um, uh, you know after Armando's presentation as well sort of um, would like to uh, comment uh, on on uh, what we just heard and give us maybe some examples from your experience. We cannot hear you. Uh, I'm sorry. the The mic is is muted. Sorry. Excuse me. Thank you, Alexandra, for your question. And um, hmm, is it very important to understand that this dialogue is going not only in present, with, that we are in dialogue with all previous generations of collectors, researchers, and even museum visitors. And uh, we being in dialogue with them and with the contemporary people, we are always thinking about future. So it's like we are at the same time at different times, yeah, in different regions and different cultures, and we have to keep this dialogue. But hmm, sometimes it's it's rather difficult, for sure. Sometimes it's very aggressive. Sometimes it's full of mistakes, and we need to have the right to be to make mistakes because the museum themes are in the front line of these dialogues. And if the society will not provide this, us this right to make something wrong or to make mistakes, because we, are, uh, we discover the opportunities. Yeah, we are discovering the opportunities to form dialogues and to, to listen, to speak. And what is very important for the museum today to have this right, to, say, to do something wrong and to discuss it with public. Because maybe it's the only one institution who has the courage to do it openly. And uh, why collecting is so, is very, very much important, 
because you know uh, I had a friend uh, several years ago he said a very good phrase when uh, the people around the table they ask him how to live or, um, in the future or what to do next he said the only two things the person have to do all his life to collect something and to build something so collecting is not just uh, the collecting uh, of the collection of the museum we collect relations yeah and we accumulate around our museums a lot of relations uh, sometimes for me as a for representative of the russian museum community is um, i do not say surprisingly but you know it's not so special in our country all those racism disputes because there uh, is something in the amanda's report i think it's not because of the racism is a you know the history of science the history of uh, intellectual development of the society the history of the museum yes it is the european tradition yes it is a European tradition to build this kind of museums which we have. And to adopt, uh, if we will, you know, always say about racism, we will block a lot of opportunities for our museum to be adopted to different regions, to different cultures, to different situations. This is just a part of the history. Yeah, we have to do it. But it's not always racism. Believe me, on the example of the Russian ethnographic museums and ethnographic collections, let's say the people today in different regions of Russia are proud to have their um, the objects from their culture in the museum collections. They insist that uh, um, we will open the special exhibition devoted the certain regions, to the certain villages, to the certain people, because it's uh, the social level will be higher for them, yeah? But uh, to be in a museum, it's one step. Uh, what they would like to do next is to control what is museum doing. I use the right word, control. The dialogue can't be about control. The dialogue uh, have to be about cooperation. And uh, the museum the, uh, has the understanding of this process and has the understanding that uh, we have, uh, uh, it's a long-term process and it demands a lot of patience, <laughs> believe me, from our curators uh, to be in dialogue to explain that it's not possible to control, but it's possible to cooperate. The collecting is a kind of cooperating. Yeah, because between museums and between communities, between power, science, and through collecting, it's very interesting how the process of scientific communication is going on. How um, people are interested in to be involved in collecting. Different, different people. I do not mean only the local communities. For instance, the people, different people who are involved in the trading of antiquariat. Oh, I, sorry for my pronunciation, but uh, you got it, yeah? Uh, so to, to present something to the museum and uh, it's very much important yeah for, for most of them to take care about the museum's collections it's very much important for them so i think that the collecting is a very you know is a kind of new social activity which uh, to get uh, the social respect, uh, to memorize the names of different people, uh, 
to build the local histories and that's why very large museums do need uh, expeditions because to keep contacts because uh, do need uh, zoom conference and today the collecting as well is going on the web yes yeah, so the filter is very wide in russia you know uh, the ethnographic museums are not under such strong critics like in the western country for sure it's because of the, now the history and uh, we try today to keep a very good and friendly relations with mm -hmm. our neighbor countries from central asia Caucasus, pre-baltica and sometimes because of this process and we are still collecting in those regions and sometimes um, in very critical times uh, the collecting activities is the only one strong bridge which connect our um, countries and we feel that we are much more stronger than the politicians because we have this material heritage collected jointly and uh, the process is going on so but today the political issues and amanda told a lot of about them the political issues uh, for sure it's not possible to ignore them yeah but uh, and some museums um, original museums in russia uh, national museums of different republics in russia they would like uh, jointly publish the mutual national heritage which is in their collection of large museums they would like to invite our exhibitions they would like to uh, jointly develop different kinds of projects and publications but what is clear, we are not going to reshape the collections, yeah, and to move them back to the places of their regions. It's not necessary, because the most important is to share the information and to make it accessible. To do uh, to make joint expeditions and exhibitions. May so, I just refra reframe it. So basically, it's not just about collecting um, and bringing things and changing the way we are thinking about bringing things inside the museum but it's also a question of how we share the knowledge um, so yeah. it's, it's a form of decolonization can come from the way that we share yeah. what yeah. we have uh, to the outside um, it's very it's very dangerous to start to ref reform the old collections yes. and to decide to whom it have to belong yeah, so the collection science, the museums, this is a part of history. But how to use them, how to interpret them, how to make it public and accessible. That's why when the local communities are going to control museums, it's immediately stop the dialogue. The dialogue is not a control. It does not matter from what side. Mm -hmm. Or the dialogue is cooperation. And in, the, in the, those cases, the museums have to be much more patient, much more professional. And the museum, you know, they have the lack uh, of time. They are the institutions forever. The people are sometimes much more nervous and would like to have the immediate results. The, the museum have patience and why wisdom and time take a long trip for the dialogue and to keep dialogue. Julia, we have a question for you by Lynn Bayers. Um, uh, Lynn asks, how big are the collections you're talking about? Can you maybe give one concrete example? And uh, just once again, it's a, it's a question about the amount of collections in our museum. Yes. So uh, in our museum, it's Russian Museum of Ethnography. There are more than half a million of ethnographical items 
Yeah, and uh, for instance, in Spoon's camera, the ethnographic collection is 700,000, uh, and the whole collection of Kunz camera is more than a million items. So the huge museums in Russia, they have enormous co uh, ethnographic collections, but the most part of ethnographic collection is spread all over the country, in region, in the museums of local and regional history. Practically in all city, in all large uh, town, uh, in all republic, in all district, we have one museum of regional history and they have their local collections. Sometimes, and uh, what we are doing now, it's, uh, we are not, it's impossible even for our large museum to plan expeditions all over the country. We would like to cooperate with the local museums in the region and to set so the field laboratories. Mm -hmm. When we have to, when we help our colleagues to plan the collecting, to attribute the items, and uh, from other side, we learn from our colleagues how to communicate with the local community. And such joint efforts with large museums, small museums, they provide very good results. But Julia, I'm story, sorry to interrupt, but we, um, you know, the session is about to finish. So would you like to wrap up so that uh, we finish the session? Uh, you know, I think there, that nothing is constant in the museum. Nevertheless, all people think about the museum, that uh, nothing is going on. It will be forever the same. It's a very dynamic institution. And uh, it's the magic of this time, of contemporary time, is that all people uh, have the ability to influence this is a museum. All voices may be heard in the walls of the museum. And there is Thank a strong you. intervention of museums to our outside. I think that this is a very nice wrapping point. Everybody needs to be heard in the museum. All the voices need to be heard in the museum. And museums need to be inclusive and think differently uh, yeah. about their past, but also about their present and about their future. I think that this is a very positive message uh, as a conclusion of our first session. I would like to thank very much all the speakers uh, for their uh, inspiring presentations. That was really an amazing start of the conference. May I remind everybody that um, we have half an hour break and in half an hour, I mean, three o'clock, uh, 3.30 for uh, Central European time. And then please make the calculations. Uh, it's very difficult to calculate depending on where you are. But in half an hour from now, uh, the next session is starting and we have um, 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 uh, a number of sessions coming up. And then may I remind you that at seven o'clock, we also are going to have um, a mingling session, uh, which will be an amazing opportunity to sort of um, talk and continue talking uh, about all these very interesting issues that were raised and will be raised in the following uh, sessions. Thank you very much, everybody, for your participation. Thank you, Thank you colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.